risky ones to come under this as well. But, uh, you know, the overseeing with cargo is the um, advantage of air cargo over sea cargo, uh, which is very clear, not just in terms of time, uh, but the, uh, as Eski said in the presentation, underlying economic uh, growth uh, and strength is, uh, I think in my own opinion, surprisingly strong, but uh, we expect that to continue, no indication that that will ease off. Uh, you can see there is a variation in different parts of the world, uh, but uh, in the main, we expect that uh, trend to continue, maybe not as strong as we have seen uh, to date, but uh, there's no indication of any slowdown in the demand for air cargo. Okay. Um, Esgi, is there anything to add to that? Yes, uh, maybe I could add that the relative price of air cargo to shippers, uh, it is at uh, its historical low level, so it gives also a comparative advantage uh, for to ship uh, the products with by air. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we have a question about the new variant, particularly the Delta variant, um, and the question is, how do you see governments uh, responding to uh, the variants as they make plans for reopening or keeping borders closed going forward? Yeah, that, that's a great question, um, because if you look at the data, it's clear that the Delta variant is uh, widespread at, at different levels in different countries. Uh, I think it uh, counts for about 97% uh, in the UK of cases uh, similar to uh, in India. Uh, I was just looking at some figures earlier. I think Russia is at 93%. Uh, the US, I have it written down here somewhere, is at 47%. Uh, Mexico, 74%. So, you know, there are high levels there already. Um, the thing that surprised me in relation to the UK was the uh, decision by the UK to put Pakistan on the red list when they did and delay putting India when the data from uh, the UK clearly shows that there was a higher level of um, variant of concern uh, from India, well in excess of what we were seeing from Pakistan. So again, you know, it, it goes to this challenge we have. Are, are governments genuinely being driven by the scientific data or is it really uh, being influenced by other decisions, uh, you know, political risk rather than uh, health or um, science risk? The positive thing is that uh, all of the indications uh, are that the uh, variants um, are, are still being dealt with by the vaccines that are in place, that all of the vaccines are highly effective, particularly where people are fully vaccinated against all of the variants, including the Delta variant. So given that it's, I won't say it's widespread, but given that the Delta variant is out there and it's pretty much everywhere at the moment, uh, I think, again, you have to challenge whether uh, putting additional restrictions in place to try and keep it out when it's already in, uh, you know, does that make sense? Uh, and in our opinion, it doesn't. Okay, thanks very much, Willie. Um, I think the next question probably is also for you. Um, I know it's a topic that's close to your heart, um, the cost of testing. Um, and the question is, what are the main problems with testing in the UK? Why does it cost so much? Why are people being prevented in some cases from flying because of screw-ups in the uh, testing, uh, implementation of testing, etc. So maybe do you want to talk a little bit about the testing program in the UK? Yeah, th this is uh, very frustrating and you have to have sympathy with a lot of people, not just on the basis of the cost. Uh, so if you go onto the UK government website, uh, they will give you details of providers who will provide the various tests. Uh, and actually they've started ranking them in price order. The problem now is if you go into uh, all of these, and I, I tried it yesterday, uh, I think the lowest price I saw was £25. You couldn't get one uh, that cost less than £60. There were lots of people advertising the fact that they had these tests available for, and, and this is the day two test, not the day two and day eight. Uh, you know, they, they were advertising the fact that they had them um, uh, priced from £24 uh, pounds on, upwards. But in the, the vast majority of cases, you couldn't actually get them. They were so-called sold out. Now, how can you sell out of a day two PCR test, which is exactly the same as a day eight PCR test? You know, th this is a nonsense. Further supporting our view that people are being ripped off and that the government in the UK is actually facilitating this rip off. And uh, worse than that, you know, on top of 
uh, mandating these expensive tests, uh, they're taking that on top of it. So uh, it really is um, poor performance by the UK government, mandating tests, forcing people to pay for them, forcing people to go through uh, hoops to try and get access to them. Um, you know, very complex system. Uh, and, and quite honestly, you know, allowing people to advertise on a government website that they have them for sale at low prices, uh, only when you go in to try and get them to discover that none of them are available. So this really does require some honesty from the UK government. Uh, if these tests are so vital to protect the UK, and I would challenge that on the basis of the data that we've seen, where, as I said, in that three-week period to the 9th of June, the latest available, the positivity rate for people travelling was 0.5% against the UK uh, positivity rate that we're seeing today. I think it's at 2.2 or 2.3 today. Uh, so, you know, are these tests really required? Uh, is there now sufficient data to enable governments to make uh, decisions? Should people returning from green uh, list of countries have to be tested. Uh, you know, should the requirement for people on the amber list for not just testing but quarantine still exist? I think there's a lot of questions the UK government needs to answer in relation to this regime. Okay, um, thanks, Willie. Um, we have a question about some of the polling data um, and asking if we're surprised for some of the, I guess, uh, potential inconsistencies with the way people respond to some questions and others. Um, specifically, the question refers to 22% uh, of uh, people suggesting that their country is ready to open borders with all other countries. Um, then if you look at the number of people that were interested in their country or believe, believe that their country could open to pretty much all with very few restrictions, that number comes up to about two thirds. Um, and the question is, are we surprised that that's uh, so low? Um, and I guess I would just, uh, before sort of throwing that over to, to Willie, maybe for a comment, um, would be to note that that aligns pretty closely with the two-thirds who said that they expected to travel within the next couple of months. Um, so, yes, maybe in some cases there are higher percentages of people saying that they want to travel, but I suppose in their own planning we're seeing a bit of a tendency at the two-thirds mark. But Willie, maybe you, you see something else in the data. No, I, I think you've uh, highlighted it, Tony. Um, you know, you could you could go through it in in fine detail and see what you think is inconsistent. I, I suppose we we have to recognise it does vary from country to country. Uh, but when we when we look at the results um, in general, and we have drilled into it on a country by country basis, uh, you know, the the general message is that uh, people are people want to fly, uh, people are comfortable when they have flown. Uh, they think the measures are right. People are frustrated by the measures that they have to take before they can go flying. People are frustrated uh, by the cost of these measures. And uh, people recognise that, uh, you know, the vaccine is being effective. And given that the virus is here to stay, uh, we have to adapt to live with that virus. And therefore, uh, the promises about uh, the vaccine dividend should be delivered people who are vaccinated should be allowed to travel without restriction uh, and people who aren't vaccinated should uh, be able to travel with a sensible testing regime in place. So what we're seeing is you know, a shift in the consumer attitude uh, over time and I think that's going to accelerate now as people become more frustrated at the pace at which uh, governments are moving. Uh, but it strongly supports our view that uh, people want to travel, people will travel, uh, but people are discouraged from travelling by the restrictions. And there is a general acceptance that those restrictions are in most cases uh, unnecessary or could be significantly reduced to enable people to uh, get back to a more normal environment uh, as they had expected. Okay, thank you. Um, We've talked about the data up until May, which is the latest data that we have. Um, we have a question asking about June. Unfortunately, we don't have June data yet, um, but I guess maybe we could just contextualize how we see the summer season shaping up. Um, and are we hopeful that we'll see uh, a bump in the summer or is that still uh, re relatively uncertain? Maybe Willie, do you want to take that and then Eski, if there's anything additional to that? Yeah, I think the uh, evidence in terms of uh, airline schedules supports the view that airlines certainly believe that uh, demand is increasing. 
Um, and as we're seeing uh, evidence of restrictions being removed in various different countries, uh, you know, there is a greater willingness to travel. And in fact, I, I think in the case of uh, even countries where restrictions are in place, uh, there's uh, clear evidence that some people are now prepared to travel. So not everybody is discouraged by the need to uh, quarantine. As I said, there tends to be a difference between if you have to quarantine at your destination uh, versus quarantining when you've returned from your destination. Uh, so, um, you know, we're still optimistic, um, but as Eski put it, optimistic but cautious uh, about the second half. Uh, I think the, the, the fact that the vaccine rollout has been so successful, the evidence that the vaccine is effective, uh, particularly those who are fully vaccinated against all of the variants, including the Delta variant, and a, a greater willingness on the part of individuals to accept responsibility for managing their own risk, uh, I think supports the, the view that we will see uh, a continued increase uh, in activity and in people flying uh, as we go through the summer period. Esgi, okay. um, anything to add to that? Maybe uh, the slide that I have uh, shown uh, in the presentation about the bookings, uh, they refer to June bookings. So in that one, uh, since uh, consumers are booking close to the travel date, uh, it's an indication for summer travel as well. So we saw some pick up uh, in the international one. So that makes us uh, hopeful for the summer recovery on the international side as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Nick, I think we have a question for you, which is looking at um, the vaccine uh, vaccine uh, credential trial that we're doing with Qatar. Um, can you explain a little bit more what that involves, uh, how long it will be, what other carriers we might be doing a similar type of trial with? Yeah, it, it, it involves using the uh, country's uh, issued QR code and ingesting it into the travel pass in order to allow for it to be recognized and subsequently to allow for the okay to travel processes and ultimately open up the self-service tools, et cetera. So very similar to what we've done on the testing side, but you uh, specific to uh, vaccination codes uh, issued by uh, Qatar. Um, and it will run for about four weeks. Uh, that's the intention at the moment. And then, yes, the answer is we are looking and working with other airlines to expand uh, this use uh, beyond uh, beyond just uh, the Qatar uh, example. So that's where we are. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we have a question uh, about the transatlantic market. Um, there, there had been a lot of discussion prior to the G7 about trying to get a corridor between uh, the US and the UK open this summer. Um, is there any hope of that? Uh, how do you, how do we see that issue um, unfolding? Willie, maybe you want to take that one? Yeah, again, we're optimistic based on the uh, data that that uh, could and indeed should happen. Um, I think the uh, the issue of the Delta variant in the UK um, caused people to pause and reflect on whether that uh, corridor could be open. But as I said, if you look at data now in relation to the uh, percentage of cases that our uh, Delta variant, uh, UK is high at 97%, but the US is at 47, Canada is at 50, and Mexico is at 74. So it's very clear that the Delta variant is, is pretty much everywhere in that area. So we strongly believe that uh, the evidence supports reopening travel, particularly uh, given that the vaccines are effective against the Delta variant. Uh, so um, I think we have to be uh, optimistic that we will see uh, a relaxation in relation to uh, transatlantic flying uh, during the uh, coming weeks. Uh, it was disappointing that the G7 didn't make more progress in relation to that, but I, I think the major issue there was uh, this um, Delta variant and uh, the uh, low level of data that was available at the time of the G7. There's much more uh, data available now. Okay, thanks, Lily. Um, we have a question that I guess sort of follows on from that. Um, and the questioner notes that in the last months, IAT has been stepping up its uh, calls on governments to, to reopen borders and doing that more forcefully. Um, the question is, are we satisfied, I guess, with the results of that? Do, do we see that as an effective tactic? Um, and if not, what other things are we contemplating doing in order to, to try and push that message? 
Yeah, I believe it is uh, effective. Uh, I don't think uh, being silent would be more effective. So, uh, you know, we, we have to uh, highlight the evidence when we see the evidence. Uh, and I, I think it's important, as I said, that uh, consumers be given accurate data to enable them to make an informed decision. And there's a lot of data out there. Um, I'm not sure every consumer would have the, the time or the uh, ability to go into the UK government websites and extract data in relation to uh, PCR testing for people who are traveling. Uh, so, you know, we're doing that on their behalf and we're, we're making the, the data available in a simple format to, uh, you know, provide encouragement to more people to support the view that borders need to be reopened. And we are seeing a lot of evidence of that. I, I think people are generally frustrated by the inconsistency in decision making by governments. Uh, and more and more we're seeing um, people calling for uh, greater data, greater clarity around how the data is being interpreted by uh, governments and greater clarity around how decisions will be taken going forward. And, and really that's that's as much as we can hope for, that decisions will be based on scientific data uh, and that the uh, data will influence the decisions. But ultimately, uh, uh, you know, more governments are recognising the fact that we have to live with this. Uh, and the issue there is that you give people the ability to make an informed decision as to the, the risk that they're prepared to take. And, and when that happens, uh, it's very clear that, uh, you know, people recognise, particularly those who are vaccinated, that the risk to them is extremely low. Uh, and therefore, there's a much greater willingness to travel. And that's supported by the uh, data that we showed you earlier in terms of the consumer research that we've been doing. Thank you, Willie. Um, we have a question uh, for Nick about travel pass and Africa. Um, so the first part of the question is um, how many African airlines have signed up for travel pass and what's holding back uh, others from joining? Um, and then I suppose it would be also just a, a question on the general framework in which travel pass uh, could work in Africa. Are there any barriers that we're facing in those discussions or uh, anything particular to that market that we would want to share? Um, the specific number of airlines in Africa, I'd have to, we'd have to follow up and provide that uh, information. There are a number of African airlines, however, that we are working with. Um, where there have been no significant roadblocks in terms of, uh, of uh, working with uh, our partners in that particular region. Uh, there's been some struggles in terms of uh, restart, uh, specific, but not specific to the use of, uh, of travel pass. And a lot of countries have actually removed restrictions and make it make uh, travel easier uh, just has not resumed to the, to the degree that we would have, uh, have liked to have seen it. So there, there are no roadblocks. There are a number of airlines in the region that we're working with, uh, mostly around testing, uh, obviously, and as vaccines uh, uh, become more prevalent, uh, they will be prepared, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of our trials to be able to re be ready when that comes as well. So no, I don't foresee or see any challenges in that particular region beyond uh, any other reason when it comes to rolling out travel pass, quite frankly. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, we, we have a question about the summer season. So, um, see, the question says, uh, are you concerned that we could see the same scenario as last year playing out uh, and affecting companies' balance sheets, um, and specifically with, res with respect to um, question mark of the appetite for travel once the summer season is over. So I guess looking into the latter part of the year and understanding what, what we might expect uh, in the fourth quarter. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. In fact, what we're seeing um, in terms of the discussions we've had with airlines is they see an extended summer season, uh, that it will continue much later than the traditional summer season. Again, we're talking about the northern summer here. And if you look back at last year, the evidence was very clear that where markets opened, where restrictions were relaxed or removed, there was huge demand, um, probably best evidenced by uh, traffic from the UK into Dubai over the Christmas period, given that Dubai was one of the few destinations where people could travel to without restriction. Uh, you know, there was huge demand. Uh, so it, it, it just reinforces the view that the appetite is very strong. Uh, it is being suppressed by the government restrictions uh, and particularly uh, people are being discouraged by the 
uh, risk of having to uh, quarantine and to a large degree, uh, you know, the, the cost uh, and the hassle of uh, uh, testing. Um, but I think for some people, you know, that's a, a secondary issue, but it's completely unacceptable that we have a situation whereby, uh, you know, the uh, ability to travel is restricted to the wealthy. We, we can't allow that to, to happen uh, going back to the years when only uh, rich people could afford to travel. It's been one of the uh, best achievements, if you like, of uh, not just the industry, but of uh, government deregulation of the industry to enable greater competition and access to markets for consumers, which has facilitated people being able to travel. Uh, you know, the, the, if, if we're going to have to uh, continue to see expensive uh, testing associated with that, that, that clearly will uh, make it much more difficult for a lot of people to access the ability to travel. But we don't see the appetite uh, waning as a result of, um, you know, a move from summer into winter. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, I think the appetite uh, will remain uh, quite strong so long as uh, people are not restricted in terms of what they can do. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll go back to a question on cargo. Um, and the questioner asks, um, since we're expecting um, capacity of, of, on the passenger side of the business to increase going forward, um, are we at risk of a bubble in the cargo side with overcapacity um, if that passenger capacity comes back in too quickly? Um, Willie, did you want to handle that? Yeah, so uh, traditionally we say that about 45% of air cargo travels in the belly hold of uh, passenger aircraft, and that's, uh, you know, not exclusively, but almost exclusively on uh, wide body long haul aircraft. Um, that's the area of the business that has been most disrupted as a result of uh, government restrictions. And you can see that in the figures for uh, certainly the Middle East and Europe, uh, two markets that are heavily dependent on international travel. So as we see uh, the market recover, we will see more capacity becoming available. Uh, but actually demand uh, remains uh, quite strong, uh, quite healthy. Uh, and as Eski said, uh, you know, pricing for uh, shipping cargo, uh, cargo going by sea, um, is is quite high. In fact, as she pointed out, the the price uh, advantage of air cargo for shipping is uh, at a, at an all time um, uh, high, if you like. So uh, I, I think what we'll see is um, more capacity becoming available as passenger uh, aircraft come back into the the, the market. Uh, but demand is good. Uh, and, you know, ultimately in the long term, and when I say the long term, given that we're saying it would be 2023 or 2024 before we get back to 2019 levels, you could argue that there was a structural imbalance between supply of uh, capacity on the cargo side and demand. Uh, but it was still an important uh, uh, part of the business for most airlines, uh, particularly those with uh, exposure to uh, cargo markets. Okay, thanks, Willie. Um, you mentioned a sort of 2023-2024 timeframe for the industry recovery, which is what we've been saying for, for quite some time. Um, but the questioner says, you're, you seem to be taking a more optimistic tone recently. Uh, do you think that period of time to recover might come forward a bit and we could see, you know, potentially more progress before 23? It's a great question. There, there are a lot of variables uh, in that. Uh, I think we've got to recognise, for example, that... Uh, a lot of aircraft that were in the fleet in 2019 have been permanently removed. Uh, so, you know, it will take time for airlines to recover their network. Uh, I think the appetite for risk amongst a lot of airlines will be significantly lower because of the impact uh, on balance sheets. You know, the, the, as, as we've highlighted, the debt burden has increased by over 220 billion US dollars and sits at 650 billion US dollars and will probably increase before year end. So uh, I, I think it's a combination of, uh, you know, aircraft that have been retired, uh, weaker balance sheets, which will uh, discourage uh, airlines taking risk in terms of reintroducing parts of the network that were uh, unprofitable or marginally profitable before the crisis. So, and that's why, uh, you know, I think the demand will come back, but actually it's the supply side that uh, may not match uh, the demand. And again, uh, you know, we would reinforce our, our message that the, the more lead time that governments give, the better. 
uh, because it will enable uh, airlines to better plan for the uh, reintroduction of their aircraft into their uh, fleets and the restart of certain parts of the uh, network because you know the, the evidence is very clear a lot of uh, traditional our, our airport city pairs that were uh, uh, in the uh, system in 2019 are, are gone um, uh, and for some of them it will be some considerable time before they recover so I, I still think uh, recovery to 2019 levels in 2023 is right. Um, the industry might be able to uh, accelerate recovery of uh, capacity uh, faster than that, but I think the appetite to do that um, is going to be a lot lower today than it would have been if you looked at what was happening in, you know, between 2015 and 2019 in terms of network development and expansion. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a, another question on travel pass, um, and the questioner asks, what's the purpose of travel pass when you already have uh, a European Green Pass or other forms of digital health certificates being issued by governments? Um, doesn't it just add another layer of complexity? So, Nick, do you want to handle that? Yeah, of course. Um, n no, in fact, um, we encourage governments to issue these certificates. The, the, and I'd mentioned in the presentation about being able to have the flexibility to share that uh, that information when uh, by the consumer or the the passenger, so that we can utilize that in the past. So we're not looking to create uh, a uh, a digital pass or, or a uh, digital QR code ourselves. We want to be able to take that into the system to allow for it to uh, be utilized for travel purposes. So no, we we uh, we uh, quite the contrary actually. Uh, governments that issue these, they need to follow a certain principle so that we can utilize them to have some consistency. So uh, the EU, as an example, uh, we can take that and uh, utilize that for, for future travel purposes throughout the EU and beyond, because mutual recognition, as I've mentioned as well, is not a, not a given. So uh, having these passes and multitude of passes out there uh, is fine as long as we have the ability to bring it in uh, to a system such as Travel Pass, which allows for verification and subsequently to allow for the, uh, the unlocking of self-service tools, et cetera, for passenger process. So, no, I don't see them as, I actually see it as being complementary. Yeah, great. Yeah, the key there being that you can check in with the Travel Pass, whereas you can't do that with the Green Pass. That's it. Great. Um, all right, we have a, a question um, that reflects back to some of your comments at the beginning of uh, the presentation, really, where you were talking about the U.S. experience of not being ready for the restart and having some difficulties with uh, scheduling and having the right resources in the right places. Um, the question was asked basically, what have we learned uh, mm -hmm. with respect to staffing, maintenance, capacity, etc., from that, and what can we try and do differently going forward? Well, clearly what we've learned is that uh, demand can come back quicker than uh, anticipated. Uh, but the, the challenge here, and, and this one is really important, uh, so uh, I put the U.S. to one side because what we know there is that the U.S. domestic market, which represents about 66% of their total market, uh, you know, is, is a very big market with a single decision, if you like, you know, it's a, a federal decision. Uh, if you look at the EU, where international travel is about 89% of the market, you've got a lot of decision makers. Uh, and therefore, uh, going to my comments about risk appetite, I, I think you're going to see airline management teams in Europe being very cautious about the reintroduction of capacity. Because, uh, you know, we, we've highlighted the cash burn uh, for this uh, year uh, in ESGI's uh, presentation there. I think uh, total cash burn for 2021 will be about 81 billion US dollars. Uh, but if you get the uh, timing of uh, your um, increase in network wrong, your costs are going to significantly increase uh, because, as we know, that cash burn reflects the fact that in, in many cases, airlines aren't paying for fuel, uh, they're not paying for all of their labor costs because there's employee support schemes in place. All of those costs will come back very quickly. You don't have the traditional sales in advance of carriage because uh, people aren't buying tickets. They're only uh, buying tickets. Again, you can see that from Eske's presentation when there's evidence of a relaxation in, in the restrictions. So we're seeing evidence of that picking up. But you're going to see a disconnect between the cash coming in and the cash going out. Uh, 
Uh, and this is where I, I think airlines will need to be very cautious. So it is different to what we've seen in the US. I think in the US, the uh, demand in the domestic market was uh, stronger than people had anticipated. Uh, and that's principally leisure uh, via four traffic because uh, everything we've heard says that the business travel in the domestic US market is still uh, significantly down on where it was in 2019. But the overall travel is up, again, supporting our view that there is a strong pent up demand and probably supporting the view that consumers have uh, more uh, money to spend uh, as we come through this uh, pandemic um, because savings have built up significantly in, in most uh, large uh, economies and people are looking uh, to fly again. So getting, getting the timing of the reintroduction of capacity right is going to be critical and uh, there is a risk I think that the uh, rebound in demand uh, will be significantly greater than the uh, additional capacity that comes into the market and then as airlines try to increase their capacity getting the uh, their critical um, employees back up to uh, you know full competency will take time so uh, it just reinforces again the more lead time we have of when uh, borders are going to open the better it will be for airlines uh, to plan uh, and certainly um, very important for airlines as they start looking at the uh, potential cash burn as we go through the second half of this year. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we have a couple of questions uh, around cash burn which I think we've, we've answered in, in these last couple of um, interactions. Um, but then another is, is asking whether we stick by our forecast um, that was issued in April or whether we, we have a different view. Um, I guess the first thing I would say is that we would plan to issue a new forecast in uh, October around the time of our annual general meeting. Um, but Willie, I know you have some views as to how that might uh, be moving. So maybe you want to give some comments on that? Yeah, if you, if you remember when Brian uh, gave his final presentation, I, I felt that he was being a, a little bit pessimistic. I would have been a bit more optimistic, but I, I think there there's swings and roundabouts in this. You know, uh, we, we, we've seen some markets uh, open faster than we had expected and some are, are slower. You know, the evidence is that uh, long haul uh, travel into Asia is, is definitely going to lag maybe what we had expected given the uh, risk averse nature of governments there. Although we are seeing some evidence of change there. Singapore, for example, um, making comments about uh, the need to adapt to live with this virus. Um, but then Australia going the other way, um, you know, shutting down uh, most large cities in Australia again in the, the face of a, an increase in the Delta variant in Australia. So uh, at this stage, uh, you know, if, if, if it is going to change, I don't think it's going to change significantly um, based on the um, figures that we've given you so far up to May and the comments that Hesky made in relation to uh, June. But as uh, Tony said, you know, we will update that in a, in a couple of months. Um, but at this stage, uh, you know, I think you could take it that the, the forecast is is sensible, uh, plus or minus uh, a little bit. Okay, thank you. Um, Nick, we have a question for you. Um, we've been announcing and talking a lot about uh, travel pass trials. Um, and the questioner is asking, when do we actually see um, real life in sort of not testing situation use of the, the travel pass? Is that weeks, days, months away? Um, is there any specifics we can we can put around that? We're in the process of uh, negotiations with uh, one major carrier that will see the expansion of uh, travel pass. There are a number of others in the uh, in the background waiting to do the same. So we're uh, you know we're, I'm not going to put a date on it because it's not fair, but uh, we're very close to uh, a more widespread. Uh, uh, unveiling for lack of a better term of the uh, travel pass in one particular airlines network and then others to come okay thank you um I mean, an interesting question the the questioner asks um uh, how is it that we can have sixty thousand people sitting close together at wembley but still have governments with travel restrictions i don't know uh willie if you wanted to make a comment on that or not yeah um yeah, and, and this is the problem, you know, we, we have decisions that don't make sense uh, and, you know, we're, we're struggling to understand some of these uh, 
you know, why do you need a PCR when you get on board an aircraft, but you don't need one on a train when it's very clear from all of the evidence that you're safer on board an airplane than you are on a train or a bus. So, uh, you know, the, the lack of consistency, the uh, conflict between different decisions is very frustrating. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to put that to the side. Uh, you know, we're, we're not just saying uh, international air travel should open up and everything else should close down. I, I'm delighted to see the fact that there are 60,000 people in Wembley and uh, uh, I won't tell you who I'll be cheering for in the final on Sunday, but, uh, um, you know, we, we will uh, continue to push for a more sensible uh, situation with regard to international air travel, because I think the data supports, very strongly supports the arguments that we've been making, uh, that the risk to opening borders and facilitating uh, international travel is very, very low and can be mitigated with other sensible measures. Uh, particularly in an environment where high levels of uh, fully vaccinated people are, are looking to travel. Great, thank, thank you very much. Um, we have a, a follow-up question on the Qatar Airways uh, vaccination certificate trial. Um, and the questioner is asking, um, in, Nick, in your, in your discussion, you talked about a sort of a code that was issued by the, Qatar, the government of Qatar. Um, in this case, the, the question is asking, in the U.S. context, there aren't such codes being issued, um, suggesting that it's a piece of paper with a pharmacist signature to verify a vaccination. How does that fit with travel pass? Um, yeah, in the case of the U.S., there, there will be a multiple uh, uh, scenario in, in the long run, I would imagine. There has been discussions with other uh, other service providers, be it Apple, uh, Wallet, uh Google are in this space, Microsoft are in this space, and others as well, to try to take that uh, paper format and create a digital version of it, which subsequently could be used for air travel and others. That That is underway, and, and that, that will take place. But we also will have the ability to upload within Travel Pass as well and use a verification process in the background to, to make sure that that piece of paper is valid to and match to whom it is uploaded from. And so that will also allow for the ability to be able to uh, to ad address the gaps that exist, not only in the U.S., but there's other countries that are in a similar situation. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a, a question about business travel. Um, and the questioner has the view that business travel is looking brighter um, than previously anticipated. Uh, and they're asking whether we would uh, validate that that's correct or what is our view on uh, the premium travel recovery? Yeah, I think the first thing I would say is that it's uh, always important to differentiate between business travel and premium travel because they're, they're quite different. Um, you know, a lot of business people travel in non-premium cabins. Uh, and in fact, if I go back to my, my uh, old business, uh, IAG, uh, we used to publish uh, data to uh, highlight the contribution made from uh, corporate travel, both in premium and uh, non-premium cabins uh, from memory uh, total revenue this was up to 12 months to the end of september of 2019 so you know pr pr probably representative of a normal year uh, so corporate travel accounted for 13 percent of uh, iag's total revenue 13.2 percent i think it was uh, but it was uh, 8.7 percent of that was in premium and 4.5% of that was non-premium. So hopefully that allowed to 13.2. Uh, but uh, you you got even more people traveling in uh, premium that weren't traveling on business. So the general view uh, is that, uh, you know, leisure traffic, be it for holiday or VFO, will recover faster than business travel. And I think we're seeing that. I think there's a strong view that uh, given that consumers uh, appear to have more money to spend, that there may well be um, evidence of uh, uh, people upgrading to the premium cabin for leisure purposes. Uh, so while it's generally accepted that general business travel will lag the recovery in, um, in uh, leisure travel, uh, I think the outlook for premium travel, you would have to be optimistic, particularly also when you look at the reconfiguration that's taken place in most uh, long haul premium airlines where uh, a lot of great premium capacity has been uh, retired uh, through this pandemic. So um, we don't have a lot of 
data at an I, uh, an IATA level that we disclose publicly. Uh, but what uh, we can say is that um, the uh, outlook for premium, and and saying premium rather than business, the outlook for premium, uh, I think uh, you would have to be optimistic uh, about the uh, recovery in that market. And, and I wouldn't uh, confuse premium with business. They, they are two very different things. Okay, thank you. Um, we have time for, for one last question. We still have a few in the queue, so we'll try and get back to people individually with responses. But um, the questioner asks, uh, essentially, how do we see the tourism market? Um, do governments understand uh, the contribution of tourism to their economies? And are they at all concerned about that in making decisions about re reopening borders? Yeah, I think there's uh, very clear evidence and, and positive indications from countries that have uh, strong contribution to GDP from tourism. Um, the best examples uh, I would give are Greece, uh, where you know they've taken a, uh, a very positive approach to opening up their market to facilitate uh, tourism through the uh, peak summer season. Um, very much a risk-based approach uh, rather than uh, you know a simple rule-based approach. There, they've identified the risk. They're using artificial uh, intelligence to. Uh, better understand it and also to target resources where they think the greatest risks exist. Uh, but there's very clear evidence there that they um, have strong appreciation for the value of tourism to their market. Uh, I would say Spain is another example of that. Um, but there are lots of other uh, countries where uh, I think tourism doesn't have the same influence and it's principally because I, I think decisions are not being taken with tourism ministers sitting at the table. Uh, transport and tourism ministers, in, in, in my uh, experience, don't tend to rank highly within uh, most uh, government cabinets and, and therefore don't have the same influence as uh, you know, um, the ministers uh, that deal with uh, border control and uh, deal with health. And, and I think uh, you know, a lot of the decisions that have been taken uh, you know, are clearly based on uh, a snapshot of data without considering the, the full data set. Uh, and uh, that's the concern that we have, that there hasn't been a full appreciation of the, the value of uh, air transport and tourism to uh, some of these economies. I think that will change. Uh, you know, there's evidence of uh, greater awareness of, of this happening. Uh, but, you know, a country that I would point to being very weak and very poor in performances, uh, my own country, Ireland, uh, you know, where uh, they've effectively wiped out the uh, tourism uh, industry uh, with uh, two full seasons almost lost now. Uh, and it'll take a long time for, for that industry to recover. And that was a very important part of the uh, Irish economy. Great.